I am Jessica Schlarbaum. I am the Communications and Outreach Manager at New Mexico Wildlife Center. And I'm going to be talking today about the wildlife that O'Keefe likely encountered during her time here in New Mexico. A little bit about me first. Oh, I'm not going to. There we go. Um, I am originally from California. I moved to New Mexico in 2020 and absolutely fell in love uh, with all of the wildlife here. I have a bachelor's degree in wildlife biology and a master's degree in avian sciences, both from UC Davis. And uh, most of my background is in raptor research and conservation. So if you see me lean a little bit more towards raptors during this presentation, you'll understand why. And as I mentioned, I fell in love with New Mexico when I moved here, so I understand why O'Keefe fell in love with it as well. And a huge part of that is the biodiversity here. It's a little known fact that New Mexico is actually fourth in biodiversity in the country, primarily due to the fact that we have so many different ecosystems found in our state. We have the high desert, we have um, different forests, we have different plains and even wetlands here. So because of those different ecosystems that are found all through New Mexico, it facilitates a bunch of different types of species that can live here. Um, so I fell in love with that and clearly O'Keefe did as well. And so I'm going to talk a lot today about the different types of wildlife that O'Keefe encountered, mainly in the northern part of the state, since that's primarily where she was located, but we'll touch on some that were found in the southern part of the state as well. And at first, I'm going to talk about um, the wildlife that is directly reflected through O'Keefe's uh, work. So the wildlife that we can pretty much see in her work. And uh, I think the best place to start with that is her skulls. Um, so we see so many different skulls and a lot of her different pieces. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. Before I talk about different species that have um, uh, horns and antlers here. I want to talk a little bit about the difference because that's kind of something that a lot of people don't know. They, they look very similar. Um, so horns are permanent. So horns are primarily on goats, bighorn sheep, bison, and cows. Those are permanent. They're going to continue to grow throughout their lifetime. Whereas antlers, which we primarily see on elk, deer, and moose, are only grown for the breeding season and are only in males to be used as a showy breeding display. And then they're shed at the end of the breeding season. Horns are uh, bone at the core with keratin over the top, whereas antlers are all bone. Um, horns are found on males and females, whereas like I said, antlers are only found on males. Um, and horns are generally unbranched, uh, whereas antlers have a lot of branching parts to them. So we see both horns and antlers in O'Keefe's work, and we have quite a few different species of ungulates or uh, mammals that have hooves in New Mexico that have different horns and antlers. So to start, we'll talk a little bit about deer because we did see deer skulls in a lot of her work. And um, we do have two common species of deer found throughout New Mexico. First one is mule deer and they get their name because of their giant ears, their giant mule like ears. And we also have white tailed deer, which look very similar to mule deer. There's some subtle differences, um, but they obviously get their name from their white tail. And then the big bad elk that are found throughout New Mexico. And elk have a really interesting conservation story. A lot of people don't know much about um, their history because they're pretty prevalent now. There's actually about 80,000 elk found in New Mexico now. But in 1912, there was only about 20 individuals left in New Mexico. Um, they were heavily um, overhunted. There wasn't a lot of regulations. This was before the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish really started um, having a hand in hunting regulations. And so what New Mexico Department of Game and Fish did is they actually went to Yellowstone and took a bunch of the Rocky Mountain elk um, from there and brought them and reintroduced them in New Mexico. And they did this all the way through the 60s and continued to kind of monitor populations and help um, that population grow. So now we've got a good solid elk population here and they're a pretty common um, species to hunt because of that. So those are the species that are going to have antlers and moving on to the horns. So this is um, O'Keefe's painting ram's head, white hollyhock hills, but this is actually not a ram's head. This is a Spanish goat skull. Um, so we don't have those native here, but we do have a, a couple other species that have some really impressive horns um, in New Mexico. And the first one is bighorn sheep. And we actually have two different subspecies of bighorn sheep. We have the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep and the desert bighorn sheep. 
And just like the elk, the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep and desert sheep were hunted to near extinction. The Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep was basically completely extirpated from New Mexico. Um, and so again, the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish and the Taos Pueblo actually helped in the reintroduction effort of um, putting uh, the different sheep in, in New Mexico. And we actually have one of the largest uh, sheep herds for hunting in uh, the country now because of that reintroduction effort. And there's still a very limited number of hunting tags available to help just keep this population um, uh, at a, a good number. Pronghorn. Pronghorn are one are, are a species of antelope that you look at and think that it comes from the plains of Africa, but they are native here. Unlike the oryx, which is a species that was introduced to New Mexico from Africa, um, the pronghorn is native to North America. Um, they are one of the fastest land animals in the US. And uh, not so fun fact about them, they don't jump fences. They have a very severe aversion to jumping over any gates or fences, which has posed a problem with um, a lot of private properties putting up fencing and, and, and property lines. Um, it's not that they don't have the capabilities, they're amazing jumpers. They just, for some reason, have an aversion to it. So that is uh, the pronghorn here. And these are all of the, the kind of common ungulates you'll see. There's a lot of other species as well, but the ones that I wanted to highlight today. And O'Keefe had a lot of uh, clean, pristine skulls in her work. And obviously she did a lot of work cleaning them up and bleaching them and making them look nice, but I'm sure she had the help of scavengers. Um, scavengers are known to pick bones almost completely clean um, when they're found. And so I'll highlight some of the scavengers that she probably came, came across or at least helped her with cleaning off those uh, skeletons for her work. And the first one I want to highlight, and one of my favorites, is the turkey vulture. Turkey vultures get a really bad rap because they are kind of ugly. Um, they've got a bald red head, and they're kind of seen as the bringers of death or the predictors of death. Um, but that is absolutely not the case. They uh, cannot predict death. They also are uh, not able to kill things. They have little chicken feet, and they have beaks that are made for tearing flesh. So they're not able to actually kill anything, um, and they can't predict death. They just use their really impressive sense of smell to detect any any rotting dead carcasses. Um, so they're going to be some of the first to the scene with uh, with scat with um, uh, carcasses because of that really good sense of smell. Um, they have some of the most powerful stomach acid in the animal world. In order to digest all of the bacteria and viruses that would otherwise spread um, from those carcasses. So they can eat those, digest them, process them, um, and prevent them from spreading further. So they're really important to our ecosystems because they're going to eat all of those nasty things that would otherwise pollute our environment um, and make a lot of other animals sick. I really like this picture that I found because it has a bunch of different scavengers in it um, that will you'll find throughout New Mexico. So the first one is a coyote. You can see a coyote in there. Um, a coyote. Coyotes are pretty common all through um, Santa Fe area. We get a lot of calls about them in El Dorado area, so they're definitely around here. And they're scavengers. They're going to take advantage of any carcasses that they find. They're also omnivores, so they will eat um, other kinds of things as well, but um, they're definitely opportunistic. So they're going to hunt small mammals or scavenge these carcasses. Moving on to corvids, you can see a few different species of corvids in this picture. And corvids are a group of uh, highly intelligent birds that encompass ravens and crows and jays and magpies. So um, the common raven is one of the most common species of um, larger birds you'll see flying around New Mexico. They're primarily going to be found in small family groups. They're not in the large groups that crows are found in. Um, and again, they're highly, highly intelligent. Crows, quite a bit smaller than ravens, um, also found throughout New Mexico. And again, they're going to be found in those larger family groups. And then magpies are a smaller corvid species. Um, they are very, very impressive. They are able to use tools to acquire food. Um, they can mimic different sounds, which is pretty impressive. We have two ambassador magpies at New Mexico Wildlife Center, um, and they've picked up on quite a few different uh, words and phrases that we use. 
and they get different puzzle toys every single day because otherwise they would get really bored. So they get lots of different things to interact with and play with um, to, to get their food. And we actually just had a giant group of, it was like 15 turkey vultures and probably 10 ravens and two magpies all flying around near the center. And so we were curious, we're like, what died? Something died clearly because all of these birds were just honing in on this spot. So we walked over and uh, we found they, they definitely smelled a rotting uh, skunk carcass and we could smell that as well. So they uh, all grouped there. It was really cool to see all of them kind of working together there. Rattlesnakes are another um, another animal that we see pretty directly in O'Keeffe's work and her um, de decor. So she has this rattlesnake in her living room bench. And well, I don't know what species it, is, species it is just by looking at the skeleton. There's two common species of rattlesnakes found in northern New Mexico. There's quite a few other species that are found throughout New Mexico, but these are kind of the two main ones you're going to see in northern New Mexico. First one is the western diamondback rattlesnake, and that's one of the largest species found here. And then the other one is the prairie rattlesnake. And we have an ambassador prairie rattlesnake at New Mexico Wildlife Center named Napoleon. And rattlesnakes are another species that are pretty misunderstood. Um, they really don't want to cause any harm. They just want to live their lives. Um, if you leave them be, they're going to leave you be. Uh, if you are out hiking and you hear a rattlesnake, the best thing you can do is just move on. Um, if it's in a bush close to the trail, give it a wide berth when you walk by, but just continue just moving on. Don't bother it. Don't poke at it. Please don't try to find it. Um, that is when things go wrong. So just leave them be. Um, obviously, when rattlesnakes show up in your backyard, that can be a, a problem, especially if you have kids or pets. Um, and one thing you can do is you can call us at New Mexico Wildlife Center. We do have a couple contacts that will relocate rattlesnakes and from backyards to appropriate habitats. Um, so if you have a rattlesnake you don't want in your yard, give us a call. A lot of species um, of snakes found in New Mexico also resemble the rattlesnake. Um, so before you do anything with any snakes, just be sure to make sure that it is or isn't a rattlesnake. And you can always send pictures to us at New Mexico Wildlife Center. We get a lot of pictures of bull snakes where people are uh, concerned that it's a rattlesnake and we can confirm, hey, it's a bull snake. Those are great to have around, just leave it be. So those were primarily the direct wildlife that we see in a lot of O'Keeffe's work. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the wildlife that she probably encountered. Um, this is all speculation, but probably encountered based off of her work. And I wanna talk now about pollinators because we know that O'Keeffe had a lot of flowers um, in her paintings and she got really up close with those flowers. So to get that level of detail, she probably saw a lot of pollinators around those flowers. Um, and New Mexico is really diverse in pollinators, and I'll talk about that in the following slides. Um, in the US, there are over 70 pollinators listed as threatened or endangered, and that's probably a very large underestimate of pollinators that should be listed. They are really susceptible to habitat loss and pest pesticides, diseases, non-native species, and climate change. So there is kind of a pollinator crisis going on right now um, in the US of a lot of pollinators are declining. Luckily, New Mexico is a state that is doing a lot to help their pollinator population. The Xerces Society is um, really active in New Mexico. There's different uh, branches throughout. And you can look on their website and they have a whole list of different plants um, that you can put in your yard that will help facilitate pollinators. Um, it, it has lists of the specific pollinators that are found here and just other ways that you can help them. And there is the uh, Share with Wildlife uh, program where people can purchase a special license uh, plate and all those funds go to the Share with Wildlife Fund, which goes to fund agencies and groups like New Mexico Wildlife Center. Um, and so they have a pollinator uh, plate there. As I mentioned, New Mexico is incredibly diverse in their pollinators. We have over 300 species of butterflies found in New Mexico. And these are two of my favorites. The Western Tiger Swallowtail is a really large yellow butterfly. And I see them all over uh, New Mexico Wildlife Center flying around. And then the monarch butterflies, which are a pretty well-known species um, of decline. And again, that Xerces Society is gonna have some great plants that you can put in your yard to facilitate these two species. 
We have over 200 species of moths, and I specifically want to highlight the white line sphinx, um, which is sometimes called the hummingbird moth. And those are all over right now. They really increased with the monsoons this year because of all the flowering plants that showed up. So I have seen them all over my backyard. Um, we were at a program the other day and we had a flower on our table and we had a hummingbird moth that sat there for about 20 minutes um, hanging out at the flower. So it was really cool to see. And they're called hummingbird moths because they're about the size of a hummingbird and they fly like hummingbirds. So from a distance, if you see one drinking nectar from um, a flower, you can kind of think it looks, it, you, you might think it's a hummingbird, but it's actually a moth. Um, and some people get freaked out by them because they are pretty large. Uh, but they're not going to do any harm to you at all. I know it's a little freaky to have a giant insect flying around, not quite sure where it's going. Um, but if you just stand still and leave it be, it'll, it'll move on. We also have over 1,000 species of bees. Um, and that's not just the large colonial bees like honey, honey bees, but also the um, uh, solitary bees like bumblebees and carpenter bees. And uh, one thing you can do to help bees is create these adorable little bee hotels. If you look up bee hotel online, they have some really cute ones. Um, it's basically just like a little kind of outline of a birdhouse with different dowels in it. And that has little holes for the bees to uh, nest in or uh, live in. So those are really useful to help our bee species. And again, the Xerces Society has information about that. And hummingbirds, we have seven species of hummingbirds here. The rufous hummingbird is an especially uh, common in, uh, species that is around New Mexico in the fall, um, or sorry, in the late summer. They're leaving right now um, to migrate south, but they're really active in the late summer. They have a later breeding season here. And they're really funny because they are a very small hummingbird species and they're bright orange. You'll know if you see one. And they are incredibly aggressive to each other. So if you have a hummingbird feeder in your backyard, you'll oftentimes see Rufus hummingbirds battling it out for the feeder. It is crazy impressive. Um, I love watching their little tiffs and arguments. And then also the black chin hummingbird is another pretty common species, less aggressive, less feisty, um, but more common uh, during the uh, spring and summer, I think, in New Mexico. We also have two endangered bat species here. We have quite a few other bat species that are insectivores, but just focusing on the pollinators, we have two endangered bat species the Mexican long-tongued bat and the lesser long-nosed bat. And you can actually see in the picture of the lesser long-nosed bat that it is completely covered in pollen. Um, so they really get in there with those flowers and help spread that. So those were likely a lot of the pollinators that O'Keefe came in contact with, uh, with her flowers. Now, thinking about the desolate badlands and mesas, O'Keefe had quite a bit of this landscape art um, with these beautiful hills and mesas, but the thing is they're really dry and there's not a lot of vegetation. So what can survive here? There's some species that pretty much thrive in these ecosystems and that's going to be different rodents, uh, rabbits, and reptiles and the predators that eat them. We have a bunch of rodent species in New Mexico and they range um, all over the place. But the kangaroo rat is an especially impressive one because they are uh, really good at uh, adapting to dry ecosystems. So they are able to get basically all of their water source that they need from their food. Um, so they're really good at surviving in these dry climates with limited water. And then pocket mice, there's a bunch of different species. Those are just kind of going to be those basic mice you see around. Um, and these are some really good snacks for some predators that I'm going to talk about in a second. Rabbits. We have two species of cotton, two primary species of cottontails here. We have the desert cottontail and the mountain cottontail. And we have two species of jackrabbits, the black-tailed jackrabbit being one of them. Now, you oftentimes think of rabbits as prolific. They are fast breeders. There are hundreds and thousands of them everywhere. Unfortunately, over the past two years, their populations in New Mexico have declined drastically. And that is because of a virus that was brought here called the rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus. Um, and so that has 
impacted their populations greatly. It causes them to die very, very quickly. Um, once they have this virus, it, there's not really much you can do to prevent them um, from dying from it. So it's, it's a very unfortunate disease. There's a lot of research going on um, trying to figure out, you know, how can we sustain these populations? And while a lot of you are like, well, that's fine. Less rabbits is fine. That's less rabbits to eat my food or eat my plants in my yard, right? Unfortunately, that's also less food for predators. So these are really important food sources for raptors and mammalian predators. And so we suspect that we might see an impact on those populations in, in uh, later years. So while we're not sure what's gonna happen with these populations, we know they're declining. We have seen a dramatic decrease in the number of um, baby rabbits that we're admitting to our wildlife hospital during breeding season. So we know it's impacting um, the amount of reproduction that's happening as well. And so we'll see what happens in the future, but we're all quite concerned about this. Reptiles, New Mexico is known for our reptiles. We have so many different species. And if you all are interested in learning more about the diversity of species of reptiles in New Mexico, the New Mexico Herpetological Society has a great website that has like every species you'll find here, the range, different behavior, what they'll eat. Um, it's a really um, extensive source for anyone who wants to learn more about reptiles and amphibians. Um, I'm gonna highlight just two which was hard to pick the two I wanted to highlight, but the greater short horned lizard is absolutely adorable. Um, the horned lizards are really, really cool. There's a few different species found through New Mexico. And uh, while they look really adorable and cute, their defense mechanism is not so adorable and cute. When they are presented with a predator, they burst a capillary in their eye and shoot blood out at it. It's pretty horrific, um, but it is quite an effective mechanism to deter predators. That would deter me if I were to go towards one of them. Um, so cute little lizard with quite an impressive defense mechanism. And then the Chihuahuan spotted whiptail. We have a lot of different species of whiptails in New Mexico. And uh, something really interesting about whiptails is they're one of the few species of animals that um, uh, uses parthenogenesis as a reproductive mechanism. So if you see a spotted whiptail, it is a female. There are no male whiptails um, in that population because the females are all clones. So there's some benefits and there's some cons to that system, but still a pretty impressive way of living, very different from how most species of animals um, do reproduction. Moving on to the predators that eat all these little things. So we talked about rodents, rabbits, and reptiles, and now we're gonna talk about the predators that eat them. So the Mexican gray wolf is the first species I wanna highlight because they have one of the most interesting conservation stories of our predators that we're gonna talk about. The Mexican gray wolf is the smallest gray wolf subspecies um, found in the United States. And we don't know a lot about their populations prior to the 1970s, 1980s. Um, we know that they were heavily uh, persecuted by livestock managers um, for understandable reasons. But unfortunately, because we weren't monitoring those popu that, their population, they were hunted to the point that there were only, um, they were presumed extinct in the wild in 1980. Um, so there is, uh, they were listed in, they were listed as an endangered species federally in 1976. And between 1970 and 1980, five individuals from the wild were taken and put into a captive population to help with a captive breeding program. And oftentimes these captive breeding programs, like we saw for the peregrine falcon and the California condor, are kind of a last ditch effort. You know, we see this population is on the brink of extinction. There's literally a, a number of them that I can count on my fingers left in the wild. So we're gonna take them, we're gonna put them with the captive population and hope that we can rebuild the population and put them back in the wild. And so luckily, um, it's been pretty successful. So the U.S. population count in 2021 of Mexican gray wolves was 196. So we went from presumed extinct in 1980 to 196 in 2021. And there is 112 individuals in New Mexico as of that count. Um, so we don't quite know what 
the, what the future holds for them. There's still a bunch of conservation efforts and captive breeding programs to try and help this species. Um, I forgot to put up my graph here. So you can see that we've had quite an increase in, in the population. So we don't know what that population size was when O'Keeffe was in New Mexico, but we can hope that she saw them more than we see them. Um, again, she was primarily in Northern New Mexico. These are in Southern New Mexico for the most part, but again, hopefully she saw a few of these species before they went almost extinct. Bobcats and gray foxes are two other mammalian predators that are very common around New Mexico right now. You often, we, we get calls at, at the Wildlife Center all the time, people saying, oh, I saw a gray fox, I saw a bobcat in my yard, you know, they're around. Um, bobcats are carnivores, they're just gonna be meat eaters. Gray foxes are omnivores. Um, so if any of y'all are on Facebook and you, uh, you can look up Critters of New Mexico, which is a cool Facebook page with lots of um, pictures that people post of animals just seen throughout New Mexico. And I'll often find videos um, posted on there of gray foxes climbing people's fruit trees in their backyards and picking fruit from their trees. So they're really gonna take advantage of whatever they can find They'll eat small mammals, they'll eat lizards, um, they'll scavenge, they'll, they'll kind of eat whatever they can find. Um, so they're a cool little species. And we have both a bobcat and a gray fox as ambassador animals at New Mexico Wildlife Center, um, and you can come visit them. Raptors, my favorite. Red-tailed hawks and Swainson's hawks are two common hawk species in New Mexico. Red-tailed hawks are actually one of the most common raptor species in North America. They are found pretty much in every single habitat type in urban areas, in rural areas, in deserts. You know, they are, they're going to take advantage of whatever food source they find. They're a pretty large hawk species. So if they can kill it, they will eat it basically. So small mammals, um, they'll even take bird species occasionally, snakes. Um, they'll, if, if anybody has seen the videos of people saying snakes are dropping from the sky, it's probably a red-tailed hawk that picked one up and dropped it. Um, so red-tailed hawks are a very impressive raptor species. Um, and we have two of them at New Mexico Wildlife Center. Swainson's hawks. Um, are another larger hawk species found in New Mexico. And they actually migrate out of New Mexico during the winter. So right now, all of the snakes and hawks are leaving New Mexico or have already left New Mexico and are migrating south. And they're one of the farthest migrating uh, raptor species in the world. They will migrate from as far north as Canada to as far south as Argentina. And they'll do that twice a year. They'll go down there in the winter and come back up in March and April. So they have a long distance to travel and they do a lot of preparation before that to help um, stock up on energy and build their muscle before that. And we have two Swainson's hawks that live at New Mexico Wildlife Center, Cricket and Hopper. Um, and something interesting about them is even though they are in human care and are clearly not gonna be migrating to Argentina, their bodies are telling them otherwise. They are getting sensory cues from the environment that is telling them, we need to go to Argentina right now. So they get really, really antsy. They get really hungry. They exercise a lot more in their enclosures. And so to help them with this, we feed them a lot more. We take them out to fly them a lot more and just try to help them through this process. And it's only about a month and then they settle and they're like, well, I guess I'm not going to Argentina, I'll stay here. And then they settle. Um, but it is interesting to see that they have that natural instinct still even when they are in human care. Swainson's hawks also suffered from a huge mortality event in the 90s. Um, there was a specific toxic pesticide that was being used in South America that was impacting Swainson's hawks specifically. Swainson's hawks, when they go down to their wintering grounds in South America, they primarily eat grasshoppers down there. And so since grasshoppers are going to be exposed to those pesticides, Swainson's hawks are also exposed to those pesticides. So there was about 35,000 birds that died um, during the 90s because of this. Luckily, this pesticide was banned. It is still used illegally occasionally down there, um, but we are seeing a bounce back of those populations. Falcons. We have a few different falcon species found here in New Mexico. The American kestrel is a pretty common one. They're found um, in open 
habitat areas. So oftentimes I'll see them in parks in Santa Fe. Um, you can see them in parks in Albuquerque, kind of on the outskirts of the town as well. They're not gonna be in the dense urban area, but they will be in the little pockets in urban areas that are more open. They're pretty generalist predators as well. They're gonna eat a lot of different insects and small mammals and um, basically anything that they can hunt. That's kind of a common theme for most predators is that if they can hunt it, they'll eat it. Um, so American kestrel populations, unfortunately, are declining. We're seeing a theme here. Um, they used to be incredibly abundant all through North America. I oftentimes get people telling me, you know, I used to drive along this county road and I would see an American kestrel on every single telephone pole. And now I drive it and I don't see any. Um, that's a very common phrase I've heard from so many different people. And so we're seeing that decline in American kestrel populations. We don't know why. There are so many researchers trying to figure out why their populations are declining and how we can help them. Um, and one way that people are helping them is putting up artificial nest boxes. So they rely on artificial or they rely on cavities to nest in, cavities that have already been made. Um, so by woodpeckers or um, just natural dead tree cavities. And so we can put up artificial nest boxes to help them. Prairie falcon is another species. We also have peregrine falcons here. The prairie falcon um, is, as their name suggests, found in prairies, which is why I put them um, kind of associated with the Badlands mesas areas, because they're going to be primarily found in those areas where they're going to see small mammals on the ground. Peregrine falcons are known for uh, consuming birds out of the sky. Prairie falcons are going to be a lot better at hunting mammals on the ground. So prairie falcons were also a species that were affected by the DDT um, pesticide that almost wiped out the peregrine falcons and bald eagles. So the peregrine falcons and bald eagles got a lot of the spotlight but prairie falcons were also drastically affected because of that. Luckily, like the peregrine falcon and bald eagle, prairie falcons have bounced back since DDT was banned and they're doing pretty well. Owls, lots of owls here in New Mexico. We are actually one of the most diverse states when it comes to owl species. We have almost every owl species that can be found in the United States in New Mexico. There's only a few species that are not found here. So that ranges from the giant great horned owl, which is found in urban areas and riparian areas and forests. They're kind of pretty generalist. Um, people oftentimes will see them in Santa Fe to burrowing owls, which are really only going to be in areas where um, there's open habitat, there's not a lot of vegetation, um, and they burrow in the, the burrows that small mammals will make. So if you see a prairie dog colony, that is a fantastic place for a burrowing owl to find a home. Moving on to uh, what O'Keefe probably experienced in her backyard. Based off of her work, it seems like O'Keefe took a lot of strolls around her backyard. She looked at a lot of trees pretty closely, which means that she probably saw a lot of common backyard species that we still see today in New Mexico. So overhead, she probably heard the sandhill cranes migrating. And for those who don't know, sandhill cranes um, migrate here to New Mexico during the winter. They generally arrive around Halloween and will stay here until about Valentine's Day. Um, and so there is a giant festival of the cranes um, in December at the Bosque del Apache, and you can learn all about their species. And then they'll migrate back up north. So winter is a great time to see these in New Mexico. And you can oftentimes hear them flying overhead. They have a very distinctive call. And so generally you hear them before you see them. So she probably heard quite a few of them flying overhead, um, heading down to the Bosque. Cooper's hawks are still a very common species in New Mexico, and they are doing fantastic. Their populations are great. They are small bird eaters. That is what they uh, focus on. And so because people love putting bird feeders in their backyard and attracting giant groups of little uh, songbirds, Cooper's hawks will hang around urban areas and take advantage of that buffet. Um, so we oftentimes hear people say, oh, I was watching my bird feeder. All of a sudden, all these little birds flew away and this giant bird flew by. I'm like, I was probably Cooper's hawk. Um, so they love little birds. And like I said, their populations are doing fantastic. 
a couple of species of songbirds that you're going to see kind of foraging on the ground below that O'Keefe probably saw is the scrub jay and the canyon towhee. So two pretty common um, larger songbird species found in New Mexico that like to forage seeds and insects all over the ground. And bull snakes. I mentioned, I mentioned bull snakes earlier when we were talking about rattlesnakes. Bull snakes are probably one of the most common species of snakes you're gonna see in New Mexico. And unfortunately, they do resemble rattlesnakes somewhat. There are some differences, um, but because they resemble rattlesnakes, they are oftentimes killed before people can recognize them um, because of fear of rattlesnakes. These uh, snakes are really great to keep in your backyard though. They will eat all of the nasty little pest species that you don't want, the mice, the bulls, the rats. They're gonna eat all of them. They are really good at that. So keeping them around is really useful. And rock squirrels. We have a few species of squirrels in New Mexico, but rock squirrels are gonna be the most common. We have one that hangs out around the wildlife center that we see popping around. Um, so you'll probably see these around quite a bit. So you just learned all about the wildlife that O'Keefe likely encountered during her time in New Mexico. And all of these species are still found in New Mexico for the most part, and all kind of experiencing different challenges. And so New Mexico Wildlife Center works to help all of these species um, through rehabilitation and conservation education. So as I just mentioned, there are two programs at New Mexico Wildlife Center, our Wildlife Rehabilitation Hospital, which I'll talk about in a second, and our education programs. Our Wildlife Rehabilitation Hospital can take in pretty much every um, most native species found in New Mexico. So we take things ranging from baby chipmunks all the way to painted turtles, golden eagles, and western screech owls. And so the western screech owl you see on the left there is um, unfortunately got stuck in someone's chimney and luckily was completely healthy and fine, just covered in a lot of soot. So we brought, we brought it to our center or the people who found it in the chimney brought it to our center. We gave it a little warm bath with some mild dish soap, let it dry off and recover for a few days and then got put back into the wild. We raise a lot of young orphaned animals during baby season and we're just getting to the end of our baby season. Um, so we take in about 75% of the animals that we admit during baby season. So we get a lot of songbirds that people find in their backyards that have fallen out of nests and you know the parents are, are have abandoned them so they bring them to our center. We get coyote pups in, skunks, um, we get mule deer, all kinds of different uh, babies. We do get reptiles and a lot of raptor species. The majority of the animals we take into our center are birds, and a lot of those are raptors. So this is a golden eagle here that our intern Aaron is holding, um, and it had been found on the ground, really thin and emaciated, clearly not doing so well. Um, so it's still recovering in our wildlife hospital, and hopefully will return to the wild soon. We have the capabilities to do a lot of different things in our wildlife hospital. We are basically a fully equipped animal hospital like you would see in a dog and cat vet office, but we only take uh, native wildlife. So in the left picture, you can see our veterinarian, Dr. Sarah, performing in uh, a surgery on a ferruginous hawk. Um, and she actually just performed a surgery on a crow yesterday as well and she put a pin in its uh, radius so she's able to do a lot of the different things that veterinarians would do for your dogs and cats but to wildlife so she's incredibly impressive and we're very lucky to have her um, a lot of small wildlife centers do not have the capabilities or funding to have a full-time vet and so we are very very fortunate that we receive funding from a foundation specifically to have a full-time vet. So we can do a lot more um, than a lot of centers can do for the wildlife that comes in. And the middle picture is of a, a prairie falcon that suffered from a wing injury. And then over to the right here, this is a turkey vulture that had been shot. So you can actually see the pellet circled by those yellow um, circles. Um, Unfortunately, this one did not make it. It was severely, severely injured um, because of these pellets. It was so thin. Um, it had absolutely no body fat or muscle on it anymore. It had been down for a really long period of time. 
And we do get quite a few species in that have been the victim, victims of being illegally shot. And so we report every single one to US Fish and Wildlife Service and local police. Unfortunately, there's not a lot that can be done after the fact. Um, and so we always say, if you see something happening with wildlife that you suspect is illegal or wrong, you can give us a call, you can give your local um, police officer a call, you can give uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service a call or New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. All of those agencies can step in and help out with those situations. The goal of our wildlife hospital is always to release wildlife back into the wild. Um, so we do everything we can to keep them as wild as possible. So that means minimal human contact. Um, a lot of our predators that we get in, we do live prey testing to make sure that they can hunt before they go back to the wild. Um, and we do a lot of behavioral analysis and flight analysis for our birds to make sure that they're gonna thrive before we put them back in the wild. Our education programs takes kind of what we learn from our wildlife hospitals. So if we're seeing an increase in gunshots or rodenticide or other issues, we bring that to our education side and use that during our education programs. And we have about 32 ambassador animals. These are some of them here on this slide um, that help us to spread our conservation mission. So we have a few different mammal species. We have a, a bobcat, a gray fox and a raccoon. Um, we have a bunch of raptor species ranging from falcons to hawks, to eagles, to owls, um, as well as some reptiles as well. And all of these can be seen on site at New Mexico Wildlife Center if you come to visit. Our education programs reach about 7,000 people each year. We do over 200 programs each year, and they range from in person programs to uh, virtual programs, we do classroom programs as well, community events. So we do a lot of different types of programming um, and we do animal encounters on site at our uh, facility as well. And none of these, neither of these programs would be possible without our volunteers. So we have a volunteer force of about 90 volunteers that help us out. Um, quite a few of them help on site with our wildlife rehabilitation hospital and our education side. We also have a huge network of transporter volunteers that are found throughout the state to help get wildlife to us. Um, and so that's one way that you can help us out. And our volunteers do everything from handling our ambassador animals to prepping diets for our wildlife rehabilitation patients, folding laundry, a lot of laundry folding, I'm so sorry. Um, a lot of construction work as well, helping to fix up enclosures and helping with education programs. So our volunteers kind of have their hands in all aspects of the center. Now you might be wondering, how can I help New Mexico Wildlife Center? And I have a list of ways that you can help depending on your capabilities. So the first one is if you're a hunter or an angler, we always need meat and fish donations. As I mentioned, we have a lot of carnivores on site, which means they eat a lot of meat and fish. I put these coyote pups here because we just got in seven coyote pups this year. We re rehabilitated all of them and released them back into the wild, which is fantastic that they were in our hospital for about four months and ate a lot of meat. So we had a nice big stock of game meat that they just plowed through. And so we are looking for game meat donations. Um, so just give us a call and we can work that out with you. As I mentioned, our volunteers are crucial. And so you can volunteer at New Mexico Wildlife Center in different um, areas. I'm a volunteer coordinator and I'll have my email at the end. So you can just send me an email um, to learn more about that. Like I said, we rely on transporters to get animals to us. So even if you can't commit to one day a week helping us out in our wildlife hospital or education, um, being a transporter is not really much of a time commitment. It's, we'll call you if we have an animal in your area. If you're available to bring it to us, great. If not, no big deal. Um, and so that's one way you can help us out. You can donate to help us out. And that doesn't just mean money. Um, there's, we had someone donate a uh, fridge to us to help us with our energy cost, which is what that picture on the left is. We have an Amazon wish list that we're always updating with lots of little items that we always need. Um, and so you can check that out on our website. We oftentimes have GoFundMe campaigns or campaigns specifically for enclosures or any tools that we need. So you can keep an eye out for that. 
You can also visit our center. We are open Monday through Saturday from nine to four. We're located just south of Española, so about 25 minutes uh, north of Santa Fe. And we uh, have about, like I said, 30 ambassador animals on site that you can come visit. We have animal encounters throughout the day um, and you can learn all about the native wildlife in New Mexico. And one of the easiest ways you can help us out is by following us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, although TikTok is not very active. Uh, but our Facebook and Instagram page, we post five days a week. If you're looking for your daily dose of cute or heartwarming, that is where you'll find it. So be sure to give us a follow um, to learn all about that. And that is it. Um, I am available for any questions y'all have. And again, my email address is on this slide, as well as the phone number for the center with my extension and our website. Um, so uh, you can check those out. Great. I think my audio was picked up on your computer. Jessica and I are sitting right next to each other. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I know that computer picks up audio really well, so you don't have to unmute yourself. Um, but if you'd like to repeat the questions, just in case, uh, the first one is what do burrowing owls eat? Okay. Burrowing owls are going to eat a lot of different things. They're going to eat a lot of insects. So they'll eat grasshoppers and crickets. Um, they'll eat small mammals. They'll even eat uh, lizards as well. So they eat a lot of different things. Um, basically, as I keep saying, if they can kill it, they'll eat it. Thank you. Uh, your next question is, if the diseased rabbits are eaten by the predators, are they affected too? Not yet. Um, so I don't think there has been any, any instance of transmission between rabbits and other species yet. Um, that's a great question. And that's something that a lot of researchers are monitoring closely because that is a possibility of that virus mutating and being able to be uh, carried or diseased by other species. So our veterinarian would know a lot more about that, but uh, that's all I know so far about that. Great. Um, this is less a question and more a like fun fact, but uh, this uh, attendee said, as many know, O'Keefe had often rattlesnakes nesting near the patio at her ghost ranch house, which worried her because of her dog. She had uh. six chow chows throughout her life. <laughs> So I definitely understand that worry. Yes, that can, like I said, rattlesnakes in your backyard, not the best situation if you have pets. <laughs> um, another asked, you know, did Georgia depict all these bird species, which I can answer half of if you like. Um, she wasn't, um, she didn't usually paint birds. She has maybe one really famous bird painting. It's the blackbird above uh, the snow covered red hills. But other, and like a watercolor of ducks, that's really nice. But I think Jessica was mainly showing those uh, bird species because they help scavenge the animals she'd often, the animal bones she'd often find, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So again, this is all kind of speculation of the species that she probably encountered during her time um, out in uh, the New Mexico wilderness. Let us see. There's, there's a, quite a few questions coming in now. <laughs> Um, what are the key ways to distinguish a bull snake from a rattlesnake? Great question. So the easiest way is if there's not a rattle, it's probably a bull snake, but oftentimes you can't get close enough to see that. Um, their head shape is going to be another way. So rattlesnakes have quite a triangular head, whereas bull snakes are going to have quite an oval shaped head. Unfortunately, bull snakes, when they are threatened, will try to mimic a rattlesnake. And so they will puff up their head to make it look triangular, but it still isn't quite that shape of a rattlesnake. And you can look closely at pictures of rattlesnakes versus bull snakes and see that rattlesnake heads are very different from bull snakes. The coloring is gonna be a little different too. Um, bull snakes have quite square shaped patterns going down their back um, and it's pretty narrow, whereas rattlesnakes are gonna have more circular, hectagonal shapes going down that wrap around their body a little bit more. Um, so those are a couple of the ways. Um, if you come visit New Mexico Wildlife Center, you can take a really close look at our bull snake and our rattlesnake safely, and you can really see that difference. Thank you. Very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> um, Linda asks, 
I may have missed these, but were coyotes and mountain lions among the oak teeth animals cited? Could you briefly address the dangers of lead ammunition? Yeah, so both of those species um, have been around and are still around. Uh, lead, ammunition, lead ammunition is definitely something that's impacting a lot of different wildlife species um, and lead ammunition has been banned in a few different states. Um, and so basically lead poisoning happens when hunters will um, kill an animal, will shoot an animal using lead ammunition and will basically leave the carcass with that lead ammunition in it in the field. And then animals will come scavenge it like the coyotes, like the California condors in California, um, and will consume that lead and then suffer from lead poisoning. And so that's actually something that we look at at our wildlife center is if we get in a raptor species or a scavenging species that has signs of neurological condition and just isn't quite acting normal, that's one thing we'll test for is lead poisoning. And we have a lead poisoning uh, testing kit um, at our center. So we're able to do that in-house, which is really great because that is a common thing we see. A lot of species will also have levels of lead in their system. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's impacting them drastically, but it might change their behavior enough that they will accidentally get hit by a car or will not be able to hunt very well. So even if lead poisoning isn't the main cause for death, it can impact their behavior such that it leads them to other causes of death. So thank you so much for bringing that up because that is definitely a, a topic that is interesting to talk about. Thank you. Uh, next question, Claudia asks uh, that she would have loved to see O'Keefe paint a bobcat or gray wolf image. They're so beautiful. Uh, can you think of any ways the arts can help your mission at the center? Yeah, we have a couple artists. Uh, Barbara Meikle is one of them. Barbara Meikle comes and paints um, our ambassador animals and then holds a big um, showing at her gallery. And we go out with our ambassador animals and a lot of the proceeds go to us. She live paints our ambassador animals at that showing. Um, so we do that every single year. So keep an eye out for that. She's fantastic. Um, we've also have artists just come and donate their works to us for us to sell. Um, so we obviously um, will put it up on our wall just like a gallery. We'll talk about the artist and they'll basically just donate it to us to do whatever we want with it. And same with Barbara Meikle. She gives us a bunch of her paintings each year and just says, do whatever you want. So it's fantastic. It's really beneficial to us. Um, obviously our ambassador animals and wild animals are an amazing uh, inspiration for a lot of artists. And so that's one way we help. We get a lot of help from artists. We also have art classes that will come out and live draw our ambassador animals on site, um, as well as we have a photo day as well, where people who do photography can come out and take pictures of our ambassador animals. So lots of different ways you can help out. Do you have a newsletter or do we find out through following your Instagram? Maybe? So you can do both. So we post all of our events on our website and our social media. We also have a newsletter. So if you're interested in signing up for that newsletter to learn all about Basically, we, we talk about everything that's happening at the center as well as everything uh, important that's happening with wildlife in New Mexico. So if we see a disease um, popping up like West Nile virus, that'll be in our newsletters. So it's a really great thing to just follow. You can send um, me an email and I can add you to our newsletter list, um, but just ways to continue to follow what we're doing. Uh, I think this is a great question that just came in from Joe. Are there any invasive animals in New Mexico? Great question. And one of my favorite topics. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, there are. Um, I studied this for my master's degree, so I very much am interested in invasive species. Um, we have European starlings and house sparrows, which are two really common songbird species found in New Mexico. Um, they're found all over North America. Um, and if you don't know that story, um, it's a pretty interesting story. Someone came over from, uh, I think it was England, and was sad to find that Shakespeare's birds were not here. So all the birds that Shakespeare talked about, the starlings, the house sparrows, were not here in North America. So we said, you know what? I'm going to release them here. So I went and got a bunch of starlings and house sparrows, went to the Central Park in New York, and released them all. Um, and starlings exploded. Exploded. They are 
one of the most prolific species here, um, and they do cause a lot of problems for native wildlife. Another species that is invasive is red-eared sliders, which is a giant turtle species. It's a pretty big water turtle, and we actually have one at New Mexico Wildlife Center specifically to talk about this. Um, if you go to like Petco or PetSmart and you see like a tank full of little turtles, probably red-eared sliders. They're a really common pet turtle. Um, unfortunately, people don't realize how long they live and how large they get and the amount of water and the size tank they need. So people get them when they're tiny, raise them, and then they're like, you know what? I don't want this. I'm going to put it in the wild. Go, they go find a pond, put it in a pond. And unfortunately, red-eared sliders are one of the larger water turtle species and very competitive. So they outcompete a bunch of other native water turtles. Um, there's the Big Bend slider that is native to New Mexico and red-eared sliders are um, impacting those. And there's the Western pond turtles in California and Oregon. It is also being impacted by red-eared sliders. So red-eared sliders are primarily found in the southeastern part of the United States, but they've been brought over here as well. So great question. I could talk for another hour about this. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. I think we're just coming up on the hour right now, 9.59. Um, so we can end on a fairly simple question from Evelyn, which is, do you accept raccoons? Oh, unfortunately, we do not. There's a New Mexico Department of Game and Fish regulation that prevents anyone from uh, rehabilitating raccoons. It's a really unfortunate regulation um, that definitely impacts us. Um, but unfortunately, no one in New Mexico is legally allowed to rehabilitate raccoons. Well, not a simple question. As I thought. Yes, unfortunately, <laughs> not the greatest. We do have an ambassador raccoon named Pepper, who is magnificent um and if you come to visit our center you can see him he oftentimes gets lots of fun puzzle toys he's trained to do lots of cool little things so um we'll end on a positive note saying come check out pepper the raccoon he's great <laughs> well thank you so much for joining us today jessica it was so interesting yeah. to learn about the natural wildlife of new mexico yeah thank you so in relation much. to ot's um, we're so sorry if we weren't able to get to your questions. You're welcome to email them to me and I can maybe pass them along. Or you can send them to me. Yes, or feel, feel free them. to send them to me as well. Yeah, happy to answer. Yes. <laughs> yeah, please do. Um, so with that being said, we're right at 10 o'clock. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Have a wonderful day. And this lecture will be available in about a week or two on our website. Uh, have a good one. Bye -bye. Right, thank you.